Flight has been a part of many of our lives, especially when it comes to travel. A lot of people like to debate whether Santos Dumont of Brazil or the Wright brothers of North Carolina were the ones who invented flight. Well, a lot of people forget that in the 1800s, a lot of air nodding through hot air balloons led to scientific discoveries and inventions in flight. Now, John Wise in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, back in those days, did a lot of air nodding and made a lot of those scientific discoveries and inventions. And in this series of videos, we're going to be talking about those inventions and his early life all the way up to his mysterious disappearance. John was born on February 24, 1808, to his parents William and Mary Trey Weiss, which later changed to the surname Wise, right near Mustard Park where he lived most of his life in Lancaster, where there is a memorial for his history in the area. He was first known as being an apprentice carpenter at the age of 16, eventually briefly being a piano maker at the age of 21. His true love though was for ballooning which came at the age of 14. Seeing many small ones that would be in the air momentarily at carnivals and reading articles about balloons, which he would then at some point start his experimenting with balloons. One legend is told that one of his first experiments was with a cat. He went to his church taking the cat and going up on the steeple to then put a homemade parachute on the cat. Throwing the cat off the steeple having the parachute deploy and the cat landing safely without a scratch. In his first year of his fascination of balloons, he decided to make his own small balloon, which was most likely homemade and was successful in launching off, though ended in a mess. The balloon fell and it landed on a roof of a house in the center of Lancaster, setting it on fire. John's first actual hot air balloon was on May 2nd, 1835, when he was about 27 years old. He made the ascent in Philadelphia, which was a successful flight in the city. With that, it had him excited and inspired to do more flights. But this flight would be the last successful one for a while because the next couple of ones took some bad turns. His second ascent happened to be more local in Lebanon County, PA, on Independence Day, a couple months after his first. He was flying the balloon when he was opening up the valve on the top of it and lost control. This caused the balloon to burst. The balloon then fell back down to earth, but John descended in the balloon without any injury at all. Then he wouldn't do another flight for a couple months until October 1st, 1835 where he had another mishap. While getting in the balloon, he was thrown back off of the balloon, with the balloon still ascending to the sky, left him behind, having the balloon with an empty basket and no passengers. The next year, May again, came along for him to decide to take a flight once more. So May 1836, he made his flight from Lancaster County over to Harford County in Maryland. He made the journey safely, traveling 75 miles, but when emptying his car, an explosion happened and burned Wise severely. After recovering a year later on September 18th, 1837, he once again decided to go back to Philadelphia and make a flight. Unfortunately, things didn't end well. He was flying the balloon and either wind pushed the balloon or there was a leak in the balloon, making the balloon fall into the Delaware River, resulting in a rescue mission for John Wise. Next, in August 1838, Wise decided to have a bit of what you would call an unorthodox experiment with one of his balloons. He decided to blow a hole in it while 13,000 feet in the air. The reason behind this is that he 
decided to make a new invention for the balloon. Since the netting on the balloon was so tightly fixed on the fabric of the balloon that when it popped, the fabric would gather up the netting, creating a parachute and float down to the ground. Well, his experiment worked. John Wise wrote, when an altitude of about 13,000 feet was attained, the balloon became fearfully expanded to its utmost tension and, and having but an inch diameter tube in the neck, the gas began to issue through this orifice with considerable noise. I would here observe, however, that any slight sound occurring in so perfectly quiet a place as is that of the balloon a mile or two above the earth makes apparently a great noise. At this period of the voyage, it was evident that unless gas was speedily let off, the balloon must burst from expansion, for she was still rising, and the explosive cord, being tied rather short, had also become tense and must evidently be tending towards a rupture at the points it passed through the balloon. At this critical moment, I became somewhat excited, and as I looked over the side of my car, I observed the sparkling coruscations of lightning springing from cloud to cloud a mile beneath me as the thunderstorm was passing its last remnants below. The storm was moving from southwest to northeast, and the balloon was sailing from northwest to southeast, passing New Village in this area, and I could now see the earth in that direction. I took out my watch and noted on my log book the time 20 minutes past 2 and as I was about returning it to my pocket, thinking at the time whether it were not best to relieve the explosion rope discharge ballast and abandon for the present the idea of this experiment, the balloon exploded. Although my confidence in the success of the contrivance never for a moment forsook me, I must admit that it was a moment of awful suspense. The gas rushed from the rupture in the top of the balloon with a tempestuous noise and in less than 10 seconds not a particle of hydrogen remained in it. The descent at first was rapid and accompanied with a fearfully moaning noise caused by the air rushing through the network and the gas escaping above. In another moment, I felt a slight shock. Looking up to see what caused it, I discovered that the balloon was canning over, being nicely doubled in, the lower half into the upper it had fallen, condensing the column of air upon which it was falling until it had arrived at a point where it was so dense that the force of the whole weight pressing down on it was arrested, which caused the parachute to tilt over. In 1855, a young woman named Blue Crusher Bradley accidentally burst her balloon near Easton, Pennsylvania. She had bought the old balloon a year earlier from John Wise. Like Wise, Bradley survived. A local newspaper called her a brave, enthusiastic, and accomplished Yankee girl. The weight of the car, however, countervailed the tilting tendency, giving it an oscillating motion which it retained until it reached the earth. The velocities of these zigzag descents were marked by corresponding notes of the wind as it whistled through the rigging of the balloon. On reaching the point where the lower current of air traversed the upper, another and more violent shock than the first was the result. From this point, the oscillations became more severe, each one causing a sensation in me similar to that a person experiences when dreaming they fall. The wind from the southwest drifted the machine several miles in its direction before it fell to the earth. As I neared terra firma, all the bows was thrown overboard, but when I struck, it was with a violent concussion, for the machine was just then at its maximum velocity of descent. The car struck the earth obliquely, and I was thrown about 10 feet forward from it. The balloon had fallen alongside of me and so complete was the collapse where the lower part had doubled into the upper that it was with difficulty separated again. The car had turned bottom upwards and there I stood congratulating myself on the result of this exciting experiment. The perspiration rolling down my forehead in profusion for the atmosphere below felt oppressive. The landing was made on the farm of Mr. Elijah Warren about 10 miles from Easton. Before many minutes had elapsed after this descent, I had resolved to repeat the experiment in Philadelphia at the first opportunity. Then, on May 1842, was one of the biggest highlights of his life. He made one of the biggest discoveries for ballooning and aeronauting, and some would even say for flight. He was making observations of air currents in the sky during a flight going to Bellefont in Pennsylvania. He noticed that there was a very large air current at high altitude moving west to east. That convinced him that it could be used to transport people across America and perhaps the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the other side of the world. In his journal, he wrote, 
It is now beyond a doubt in my mind established that a current from west to east in the atmosphere is constantly in motion within the height of 12,000 feet above the ocean. With this information that John Wise had, he wanted to use it to prove that he could use the current for travel. Well, he needed funding for an expedition to prove that. And where would he go? To Congress. John Wise, with this information of this current, went to Congress for funding for $15,000 so he could study and prove that it would be good for travel. But the only thing he got was laughter. Wise realized there was only one way to prove his findings could be useful. His idea to make a balloon trip halfway across America. Then hopefully with that, he could get the right amount of funds to travel to Europe. Another balloonist decided to tag along with Wise in this endeavor, named John LeMountain, 29 years old, from Troy, New York, who actually put together the balloon for the voyage through the direction of Wise. O.A. Geiger, a Vermont businessman, funded the trip and also came for the voyage. Lastly, an aged reporter named Mr. Hyde from the local newspaper in St. Louis, Missouri. When the balloon was done, all of the four men looked at the balloon, being 50 feet in diameter and a whopping 60 feet high. They all christened the name of the balloon to be the Atlantic. They thought it was a prophecy in the making, since the Atlantic Ocean was the next thing for the balloonists to conquer. The voyage would start in St. Louis, Missouri. July 1st, 1859 came along. The, the balloon was to make 809 miles with the jet stream that John Wise founded. Trying to convince more people it could be used for travel, then use a balloon to cross the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. At the time, it was considered to be one of the longest air balloon voyages ever made. Along with the longest air balloon scientific tests, Wise would go on to make tests on the trade winds to see when it would be perfect to launch the balloon for the voyage. Six o'clock in the evening, the party gathered around into the craft and got set to launch. With thousands of pounds of sand ballast to use, along with food supplies such as water, lemonade, wine, and well-cooked game meat. A boat was tied to the balloon and would come on their journey, a light yet well-crafted one, where Geiger and LeMountain, as well as Mr. Hyde, would stay during the flight, tied by rope 15 feet from the balloon's wicker basket. Around 6.45, the balloon was cut loose to the air to start their journey and the greatest balloon voyage ever. The ascent was peaceful and easy, the balloon moving off in an easterly direction. The cheers of the audience inside and outside of the arena were of the heartiest kind. We responded with a parting farewell and a lingering look upon the thousands of upturned faces that cheered us onward. As the balloon got higher, they reached around 8,000 feet at 55 miles an hour. As the cold and dark blanket of the night came to them, and the moon giving them the only light they had, Wise decided to check the bearing of the balloon and noticed that it wasn't correctly together. Only six ropes were holding the balloon and cutting rather than pressing against the balloon. John Wise, noticing this, knew that he had a race against time to fix it. So he put his head over the wicker basket and called for Geiger to come up and help him as quickly as he could. After about half an hour, they managed to get all 36 ropes tied correctly. Geiger went back down to the boat, and the balloon sailed on through the night. The feeble shimmer of the new moon was now mantling the earth beneath in a mellow light, and the western horizon was painted with gold and purple. Nothing could exceed the solemn grandeur of the scene. 
All was as quiet and still as death, and not a word was passing from the lips of the crew. Everyone seemed to be impressed with the profound silence that hung around us. The coy-looking moon was lowering itself into the golden billows of the Occident, and the greater stars began to peep through the curtains of the vasty deep one by one. Still silence reigned supreme. It seemed as though all nature had gone to sleep with the setting of the moon and the stars were coming out on the watch hours of the night. In another moment, the stillness was broken. Cattle began to low and some loud mouth dogs greeted our ears with an occasional bark. This seemed to break the silence of the crew and soon a lively conversation ensued. We also amused ourselves by uttering an occasional shout which set the dogs below to barking far and near. During the day and while the balloon was being inflated, the sun was pouring down upon a flood of heat and light. Although it is a proverb but that you cannot carry light in a bag, it will be learned that this ancient saying found its contradiction in our gas bag. It did carry up with its heat and light, and during the whole night it was illuminated with a brightness equal to a Chinese paper lantern. It served a good purpose as it enabled us to note the time with our watches. It appeared indeed truly wonderful, and the first impression made was that it might be an incipient combustion, and that soon it might be our lot to pass into eternity like a blazing meteor. The phenomenon was so remarkable that the mind was not at first capable of finding a satisfactory reason for its appearance. However, the conclusion finally arrived at was that it must be a combination of heat, light, and carbureted hydrogen, and inasmuch as it had been going on for several hours, it was not likely to get hotter in the upper air. So we satisfied ourselves that there was no imminent danger from a conflagration while aloft. This phenomenon is sometimes to be seen in the slightly illuminated clouds on a hot summer night. In the balloon, it was unique. Every seam and every mesh in the network could be traced upon its surface. Even the atmosphere around and beneath us seemed to partake of this mellow light. Woods, roads, prairies, streams, and towns were discernible, and their outlines could clearly be traced at our greatest elevation. Nothing could surpass the novelty of the scenery below during the early part of the night. The heavens above were brilliantly studded with stars of every magnitude and color, the atmosphere having become perfectly clear, and when we crossed water we had the starry heavens as distinctly visible below as above. We could at such times easily imagine ourselves sailing in the very center of the star region as the opaque earth seemed then out of the question. These reflected star fields were of short duration, but vanished only to make room for that weird appearance which the earth presented. One could not immediately see the surface outlined below, but keeping the eye steadily fixed downward, it gradually developed itself to the vision until every different shape and object became defined though in a most ghost-like light. The forest appeared of a deep brown cast, and when a handful of sand was dropped overboard, at our greatest elevation it could be distinctly heard raining upon the foliage of the trees. It answered as an index for our altitude in accordance with the time that elapsed between the discharge of the sand and the noise of its contact with the trees. As the crew in the balloon went on, every time they passed areas with population, they would scream out to see if anyone would call back. Yet the only response was the echo of their shouts. The reverb and the echo went for miles, differing as it were on land. The next day seemed very warm and calm, and John Wise being up all night and tending to the balloon often, decided it was time to take a nap. So he took several blankets and decided to wrap himself in them to get some rest. He thought that the balloon would be alright since the gas hose was tied safely and the balloon was filled up and the valve left enough out to keep them at a good distance in the air. He told the rest of the crew what to do while he napped, and told them to keep in an easterly direction, which then sand ballast was liberally used up while he was asleep, because the crew thought it was the right decision, yet resulted in the diminishing density of the air, which caused the hose to drop and start blowing the gas into Wise's mouth and nostrils while he slept, poisoning him into an even deeper sleep. Mr. Gager got concerned of the flight since the balloon was drastically changing in height, shouted to Wise to see what was going on or what they could do to help, but received no answer. Gager decided after three or four times of calling Wise, he would go up and check on him. When looking over the basket to see John Wise was sleeping heavily and breathing hard, Seeing that the hose was sending gas into his body, so he went to save Wise 
and Wise noted, Lucky it was for me that he was so watchful and considerate for a few minutes more would have ended my existence from the copious overflow of gas that- Giger removed the hose from his face and propped his head up, and after a few minutes of getting the necessary fresh air he needed, he came to consciousness. John coming back started to have a lot of hallucinations from the gas being in his body for too long, describing that he felt like he fell asleep for years. Having a dream where he went diving with a diving bell and having interplanetary balloon adventures. He got himself together and grabbed the ropes of the balloon to start fixing their position, ordered Gager to go back down to the boat and for all the men to take a nap if they so pleased. And the flight went on smoothly for a while. Sailing at an altitude of 10,000 feet contracted our area of visible surface below so much that we thought it would be more interesting if we should lower the airship to within a thousand feet or less of the water surface. So down we came until we nearly touched the waves. Overhauling a steamboat that was moving in the same direction with us, we struck up a conversation. The steam whistle was sounded, the boat bell rung, and a speaking trumpet conversation ensued. How do you do, Captain? A fine morning for boating. The captain immediately responded, Good morning, my brave fellows, but where in the heavens did you come from or from St. Louis, sir, last evening? And pray where are you going? We're going eastward, Captain, and first to Buffalo, and then to Europe if we can. Good luck to you, said the captain. You are going like thunder. They had reached as far as Niagara Falls and saw very many things along the way, but their voyage would turn for the worst. A storm brewed up and they went straight into it, trying to figure out a way to land safely. Yet there was no way to land. They tried to get down onto a shore, but rebounded off and went into a tree, which Wise deemed it like hooking into the Leviathan itself, not being able to move the balloon at all. Then all of a sudden the balloon broke free, stomping atop the tree line like a raging elephant, ending up to be hanging from another tree with the boat still hanging on by the three ropes. Eventually they were noticed by the locals of the township in the area of Henderson, Jefferson County, New York. They brought them back to town and gave them dinner to let them rest. Wise then got ready and made the announcement that the balloon trip was over and was unsuccessful. Despite it being a failure, it still showed that the Eastern jet stream worked very well, but didn't convince Congress to send him across the Atlantic Ocean, but with the events that happened and his adventure with it, was dubbed one of the greatest balloon voyages ever. With the greatest balloon voyage ever ending, John Wise wanted to take his innovations to a whole different level. Thus, he made the first air mail delivery with a balloon. On August 17th, 1859, John Wise sets out on another voyage that defined his ballooning career. The flight would be a transcontinental flight from Lafayette, Indiana, to the Big Apple. Most balloon airmail was not sanctioned by the post office department, but this one would have Wise carry 123 letters across the United States in order to make airmail more frequent. The name given to the balloon was Jupiter. All 123 letters were placed in a mailbag with a bronze lock that read New York City on the side of the bag placed in the wicker basket of John Wise and was ready to go. The flight took off around 2 p.m. on the 17th by the Lafayette Gas Company. This would be John's 233rd balloon voyage in his life out of 463 descents. It was also said the balloon was one of the biggest crowds that Lafayette has ever seen with an estimate of more than 20,000 people. At first, Wise had issues finding the current to take the balloon and eventually rose about 14,000 feet when he flew off, until an airstream started to drift him south, which had him dropping most of his sand ballast. With that, Wise knew that the remaining ballast would not be sufficient to keep going, and after five hours of flight, he had to be forced to land in Crawfordsville, 30 miles from Lafayette. 
when John landed, he had given the mail to a courier that would later have the mail delivered by train. Unfortunately, it was another failure, but it was still listed as the first air mail flight. It's 1861 and the Civil War has been raging. The Union Army was fighting back and forth with the Confederacy. Then the Army made a plan to use balloons that would be used to spy or be used for aerial attacks. John Wise ended up being one of those top balloonists to make a bid for the chief of the soon-to-be balloon corps for the opening months of the Civil War. He lost the bid though due to not having enough endorsements from the scientific community. So they went with one who was named Professor Thaddeus Lowe. When July 16th came around, the army was in need for a balloon to be sent to the Battle of Bull Run. They called upon Wise to come, but as the engineers waited for him before the battle, John Wise was nowhere to be found. So Professor Lowe started to inflate the balloon until the belated Wise showed up and demanded to be the one to go per Major Albert Meyer's orders. The Major and 20 other volunteers helped to inflate the balloon with Wise, then went to the battlefield. But because of the Major's haste to get the balloon going, had the balloon winding up in a couple of tree branches stuck, which led to the Army removing John Wise from the war, not even the mess up being his fault. Another wartime event John helped out with was in the Mexican War. He devised a plan to use a balloon to take over the city of Veracruz, which was guarded by Fort San Juan del Olua. He suggested a fabricated gas balloon capable of lifting 18,000 pounds of explosives to drop in the fortress. The War Department ignored his plea, yet used the plan later without giving him any credit at all. Wise would then go on to do many more flights after the war, but not very notable ones, until the one of September 28, 1879. He was at the age of 71 and was accompanied by a passenger named George Burr. They went in the balloon called the Pathfinder. They were to make a high-speed voyage from St. Louis, Illinois, over Lake Michigan. While the trip started off great and the balloon sailed great, but the last time it was ever seen was over Carlinville, Illinois, going towards the lake. That was the last time that anyone ever saw John Wise. When going over Lake Michigan, he completely disappeared. The body of George Burr was later found floating in Lake Michigan. Still no sign of Wise though. But given that they found Burr's body floating in the lake, gave little to no imagination of what might have happened to Wise. Although Wise and the Pathfinder's remains have yet to be found till this day. Many people debate what might have happened to Wise. Some normal like he died from having the balloon blow into a storm which ended up with the balloon and himself going to the bottom of the massive lake. Some would even speculate that he went into the Michigan Lake Triangle sending him into another dimension. Someone also even said that Burr was an assassin and wanted to steal aeronautical secrets from Wise. So Wise ended up killing him and fled to Canada. But until Wise and the balloon are found, it is still just theories. But one can't help but wonder, what happened to John Wise? And with that, the series of John Wise has ended, and I hope you enjoyed it. And for those who watched, thank you so much for coming and watching this. I was really excited to make this. And if you haven't yet, click subscribe and the notification button so you can see videos when I post them. I'll see you on the next one.